hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Hallelujah. Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose and let my song forever be my only boast is you. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is my life. All right, you may have a seat. Well, good evening. Hope you had a good afternoon. So there is a touch of sunlight out there. The days are getting longer, all right? So anyway, we got a ways to go there, but hope you had a good afternoon. Uh, just a couple of reminders uh, for this week and next couple weeks or so. Um, first of all, just remember, next Sunday is our annual meeting, and so we'll be uh, voting on the budget and voting on deacons, and then as well, uh, voting to take several people off of membership for non-attendance. So I uh, just uh, had that list up last week. So remember those three things in particular. Um, we, and then we did finish up the 2023 financial report. So the 2023 financial report and the 2024 proposed budget is, are both together in the back. So uh, pick those up if you've not had a chance to look at those or didn't get the email. As well, um, I forgot to mention this morning that there was a a handout in the bulletin with major dates for the coming year. And so I hope that you will uh, take, grab that, take it home, put it on your refrigerator, put stuff in your calendar, uh, plan for things. So there's quite a bit coming um, uh, this year. So we are planning to go to Mammoth again. We weren't sure a year ago if we'd be able to do it again, uh, but we are planning to do that trip again. We were able to work things out with them. And so that's exciting. And then um, just a number of other highlights coming uh, we're going to do the, uh, got the, the cornhole tournament for the men coming in March, and uh, that was a fun time last year, and then a bunch of uh, man venture, uh, VBS is in there, just a variety of different things that you're going to want to highlight. So um, if you didn't get that this morning, um, there's probably a few bulletins around, or you could ask us, we could get that to you, but uh, that's going to be an important thing for you to, uh, to have in your, have available to know, to, to make sure you can plan accordingly. And then, um, remember, WOW uh, starts up this week on Tuesday night, and so ladies, please keep that in mind. If you've got questions, uh, talk with Heidi or Anna, and they can help you out with that. And then, um, I think that's everything now. Well, uh, one other thing uh, just for you to keep in mind is that uh, Pastor Tim and I are heading out to Ironwood. Uh, there's uh, uh, five of us churches that are good friends, or well, pastors that are good friends, are, uh, we are meeting out there. Uh, tonight through Wednesday morning, and so um, uh, so us, and then uh, Crossway in Bakersfield, so Mark Brock, and then David Brock out at Faith of Cherokee Road, and then Tim Lovegrove uh, down in Menifee, and then Ron Perry up in uh, Folsom. So um, the deal was we planned for the five 
pastors, senior pastors to get together, and then we can bring one guy. So, uh, so we're excited to go out there and spend some time. So we won't be around. Dustin should be around, um, unless he bails on us. So, no. Um, but anyway, we won't be around for a couple days here. I get back Wednesday or later in the day. So just wanted to mention that as well. And excited to go out and spend some time with those guys and fellowship and sharpen each other. Um, a few things as far as prayer and praise go. It was such a blessing to see the Diaz family here this morning. And um, I, uh, I didn't embarrass him, but, uh, but it was really good to see him here this morning. Praise the Lord. It's good to see Tori here and uh, uh, doing well. And so continue to pray for them. Uh, Tori, they came home from the hospital last Sunday night. And um, obviously, still a lot going on. They're going back and forth to the hospital quite a bit. But keep them in prayer. But praise the Lord that, uh, that, that they're home. And as well, um, I mentioned for prayer last week, Marie Applett. Uh, Marie had gone to St. Mary's. Uh, she had gotten COVID and was in really bad shape. They had her intubated and everything. So she is awake and uh, making some good steps. So praise the Lord for that, that she's doing a little bit better. Uh, still, I think she's still in ICU as far as I know, um, but, but is making some good progress. And as well, uh, Roger Peterson had hernia surgery this week. And uh, so that snuck up on me, um, but, but he's at home and uh, recovering. I talked to him on the phone a couple days ago, and uh, so he said he's, he's doing all right. Um, so, uh, but, but, uh, but praise the Lord for that. So pray for Rogers. Kind of a, he had major, major surgery uh, 14, 15 months ago uh, for cancer. And so uh, this hernia is kind of the result of all the, all the re-plumbing that they did uh, to his system uh, back then. And then also, uh, Rita Gay had knee replacement surgery this week. So um, I missed that one too. I, I didn't have that in my calendar or anything, and she doesn't give a lot of details. So, uh, but uh, Lynn was here this morning, her sister-in-law, and said that Rita is doing well and uh, recovering, so, um, so we can keep her in mind. Don't have anything else that you'd like us to pray for this evening or anything you want to give thanks for? Yeah, Kathy? Yeah. Yeah, Carol had a shoulder replacement. And uh, she is in rehab for a few more days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So pray for Carol. All right. And praise the Lord for good start to midweek services so far. Had good crowds and had really good crowds in our, our adult Bible study, and I've had good conversations, and we're actually going to uh, split it in two and send a few people to my office because we are really packing out uh, room one on Wednesday nights, and it's been good discussion, and it's been cool that we've had, there's probably only, there was only a handful of us that are in there that are, have been around for any length of time at all. I mean, everyone else that's in there are people that are new to the church or um, young believers, and so it's been just exciting to talk with them and uh, share with them, and so uh, that's been a blessing too. So, all right, well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be together uh, tonight. Thank you, God, for Christ and for the hope that we have in him, and uh, Lord, help us to live for Christ and serve him and uh, give him glory in all that we do. Lord, thank you for answered prayer with the Diaz family. Thank you that Tori is feeling okay and uh, is home. And so I pray uh, for the Diazes as they travel back and forth between home and various appointments that you would give grace. Uh, Lord, I pray that as test results continue to come in, uh, that Lord, you would look kindly on them and that there would be hopeful and positive news. And so Lord, we, we pray for the doctors that you give wisdom as they determine next steps and how to proceed. And Lord, just give comfort and help and strength to that family as, as they go through all of this uh, just challenging, challenging season. And Lord, I um, pray for Marie that you would help her to continue to prove thank you for the progress that she has made and for your grace there. Uh, Lord, we pray for Rita and for Roger as they recover and, and Carol as well, uh, that you would watch over each of them and bless them. I pray that you give uh, Pastor Tim and I and the other men a, uh, just a rich time of fellowship this week, and I pray that we would sharpen each other, encourage each other, uh, 
that it would be a time of growth and uh, just blessing and refreshment. And so, Lord, we pray for your blessing there. And God, uh, thank you for uh, just all the ways that you are at work in our church, uh, for opportunities to uh, share the gospel, uh, for discipleship opportunities that are uh, abounding all around us. God, help us to, to be good stewards of every gift, every opportunity to redeem the time and to be used of Christ to, to, to minister and to make a difference in people's lives. And so, God, we pray for your help. Lord, we pray for your blessing on our service tonight. I uh, pray that we'd be encouraged and challenged and sharpened in our ministry to our community and to the people that are inside this building on a weekly basis. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll sing uh, two more songs before Pastor Kit comes back. First is, There's a Redeemer. We have a Redeemer in Christ and what He has done, His finished work for us. And then before uh, the message, we'll sing, As the Deer. Please stand with me as we sing. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Jesus, my Lamb of God, Messiah, hope for sinners slain. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. When I stand in glory, I will see His face. There I'll serve my King forever in that holy place. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us Your Son. For the water, so my soul longeth after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit. desire and I long to worship you. You're my friend and you are my brother even though you are a king. I love you more than any other, so much more than anything. strength, my shield, to you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are
are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. All right, please have a seat. Well, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9. Kids, I didn't get a sermon challenge sheet done, I'm sorry, I, uh, I'm out of candy, so you probably, um, so anyway, you'll just have to pay attention because you love Jesus tonight, all right, and uh, so, there's some uh, frozen cashews in the freezer, I guess. You can have some of those or something. But. Well, we're going uh, well, to get to this, this book is the main thing I want to talk about tonight. Before, before we get to it, um, I want to just read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, um, beginning in verse 19. Familiar passage, but I hopefully provides a, a good frame of reference for where uh, where, where I want to spend the more, majority of our time. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verse 19, Paul says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Now, this is a, a really important passage as we think about the ministry of the church, and Frankly, it's one that's oftentimes been abused, and so uh, this is a passage that people will sometimes use to, to, to justify the idea that the church just needs to be as much like the unbelieving world around us as possible. Basically, if unbelievers are doing it, do it. Do everything you possibly can to remove any and all barriers to people coming to Christ, uh, remove all offense, and, and so this passage oftentimes gets used to justify uh, compromises which, which ultimately compromise the truth of Scripture and, and a consistent godly testimony. And obviously, that's not what we want to advocate for tonight. But, and, and Paul makes clear that that's not his intent because he puts qualifiers in there. So he says, you know, basically what he's talking about is, is as he travels around and does ministry, that, that he adapts to his context. So when he's with Jews, he seeks to... He acts like a Jew. And when he goes into a Gentile's home, he adapts to Gentiles. And when he's over here, he adapts to these people. And when he's over here, he adapts to these people. And, and that's where people come up with the idea, just, just be like the people around you. You know, fit in. You know, l create as little offense as, as absolutely, absolutely possible. And, and obviously, as I said, that can sometimes lead to compromise. But, but, but he's clear there that, that no matter where he goes, no matter what he does to adapt, he is bound by the law of Christ. He never disobeys Scripture. He never compromises the convictions of God or, or obedience to God's will. So, so that is a really, really important qualifier in there. But beyond that, Paul strove to eliminate every possible barrier to people receiving Christ. Rather than demanding that the unbeliever adapt to Paul, Paul adapted himself to the unbeliever. 
If someone was going to be uncomfortable, it was going to be Paul, not the person he was trying to reach. And so Paul was considerate of the people he was trying to reach with the gospel, you know, and, and he stretched himself. So, you know, I mean, I think, I mean, I think oftentimes about the idea, I mean, think of, think of the fact that, you know, Paul, in, well into his adult life, lived as a Pharisee. Think of all the habits and patterns and just normal ways of living that he was very, very accustomed to. And then God called him to go into all these Gentile cities and reach Gentiles with the gospel. But do you think that that was just always comfortable and easy for Paul to do? In no way. You imagine the first time that Paul ate a pork chop. Now, we all, you know, I love pork chops. You know, but, but I mean, if you've, been, if you've been taught for years that it is sinful to do that, you know, but, but you're in someone's house and you're trying to reach them for the gospel and they set a, a pork chop in front of you and, you know, he adapted. He adapted to his context because he was committed to reaching people for Christ. He was zealous to reach people for Christ. You know, again, he says there, I have become all things to all men so that I may by all means save some. Obviously, God's the one that ultimately saves But he was trying to reach them with the gospel. And he was committed to doing whatever he could do within the bounds of faithfulness to Scripture to reach people for Christ. And so, you know, I think that provides a good framework for where we want to go tonight because it's very easy for us just to be in our little rut. You know, this is what I like to do. This is what's comfortable to me. This is what, these are my preferences and the way that I like things to be. And, and, and that is, is not a good place to be, right? You think about church ministry. Think about how we function as a church. I mean, we, obviously, you know, we need to serve the people who are here. But at the same time, if, if we ever get stuck in the idea that, that we are, I mean, if, you, if, if we come into church, you come into church, and your first thought is, what do I like? And, and, and I want the church to be the way I want it to be. That we are on a slow spiral to death. Because we're not here for my preferences and we're not here for your preferences. We are here to honor the Lord and to make an impact in people's lives for the sake of the gospel. And so we need to be zealous to reach people. Obviously, again, there, I mean, there's lots of fences there that the Scriptures provide, but, but we need to be zealous to reach the people that God has placed around us. And so, so that said, um, I, I want to talk about this book tonight, uh, The Great Dechurching. And um, I, I started to hear about this book uh, probably early uh, this past fall. It sounded really fascinating. And so, and so I, I, I read through it this fall, took a bunch of notes as I read through it, and, and I think it's, it's worth just taking some time uh, to, to talk about uh, what is in this book because um, it, it tells us a lot about the state of the American church. What, what is happening uh, within Christianity, within America? And, and then, um, and, and because I, I, we, can, we can learn not just, I mean, it's good to be aware of what's happening in our nation and especially within uh, the church uh, but as well, uh, there's a lot that we can learn in here about reaching our community for Christ. And as well, about guarding the back door, so to speak, of our church. You know, why do people leave the church? And how can we stop that from happening to the people that are coming to Life Point, who are members of our church, the kids who are growing up in our church? So, uh, so I think it's, uh, there's a lot of value here. If you've got questions, comments as I go through this, uh, I hope that you will chime in. Uh, so just first of all, again, the name of the book is The Great Dechurching, Who's Leaving, Why Are They Going, and What Will It Take to Bring Them Back? And the authors are Jim Davis, Michael Graham, uh, with Ryan Bird. So Jim Davis, he is a pastor of, of a church in the Orlando area, Orlando Grace Church. It's a, it's a church with Baptist convictions, as far as I could tell, um, uh, but, but probably uh, would certainly be... Um, in, in practice, uh, less conservative than we are, 
uh, though, though very orthodox, uh, faithful to, to uh, the same you know, type of doctrinal statement. Um, but, but he is the, the primary pastor at that church. Uh, Michael Graham is, an, is a member of that church, also a, has a Master of Divinity, so they're both seminary grads, and, uh, though, though Michael Graham is not a pastor himself. And then uh, Ryan Burge, the, the third guy, he is the assistant professor of political science at Eastern Illinois University. So he is more of a math, numbers, statistics guy, and uh, he is an American Baptist pastor, which probably means that he is not as faithful to uh, biblical orthodoxy. The American Baptist, that's the old Northern Baptist Convention and typically a very liberal movement, but, but he's contributing to the book for a very different reason. So uh, in particular, uh, uh, Jim Davis, the primary author, the pastor of the church, he's the one that sort of spearheaded the, the, the project that this book is about. And, and basically, a number of years ago, he's in Orlando, and he talks about in the beginning of the book that Orlando once was, was really a, a huge epicenter of, of Christian faith. And, and, and he talks about how uh, Orlando has changed significantly over the, over the past few years. And so he was really burdened to understand, as the subtitle says, who's leaving and why are they leaving, and how can we, how can we win them back? And so, and so he uh, did some fundraising, raised a whole bunch of money uh, to finance a, a huge study of, of the landscape of the American church. And so he particularly paid uh, Ryan Burge and this one other guy, um, Paul, I don't know how you pronounce his last name, Yuppie or something, uh, to do an academic review board approved nationwide quantitative study is what they say. So that's a quote right from the book. So, so this book details a, you know, a, a peer-reviewed scientific study of the American church. So this is not just someone saying, you know, this is what I feel like is happening in the church. Or this is what my buddy tells me is happening in the church. Or this is what's happening in our town, and so we assume that it's happening everywhere in the nation. No, this is a nationwide, uh, again, uh, peer-reviewed, um, very detailed study of what is happening in the American church. So, so it's really hard to argue then with the statistics that they come up with. Now, I at times have a beef with some of the, some of the um, applications, some of the ways they say, you know, what should we do about it? How do we respond to it, there's, you know, that gets more into philosophy of ministry, and there's some ways I would disagree, but, but, but the primary things that are going on in here are, are things that are just, they're giving us research and uh, telling us what's happening, and that's uh, really, really helpful. So, so it's about the dechurched. So what is the dechurched? Well, here's how they define a dechurched person. Someone who used to go to church at least once per month, but now goes less than once a year. So it's not necessarily someone that went to church every single Sunday. Someone who, at one point in their life, going to church was at least a semi-regular practice, at least once a month. But now they've essentially stopped altogether because they're going, uh, they say, uh, less than once a year, which is pretty much, it's clearly not a very important part of your life anymore, all right? And um, so, so they're focused on people here uh, you know, that, that, that have stopped going, and, and I think it's important to say that, um, that, there, that this is across every type of church landscape. So this is not just evangelical gospel-preaching churches. Uh, they include people who've left Catholicism or liberal mainline de denominations. And, um, and so a good chunk of these people were never born again, right? You know, they, they never were truly saved. Uh, although I think we'll, we'll see as we go through this that surprisingly a lot of them uh, would be people that, that you would think, at least at one point, that we would have thought were saved. So uh, that's just helpful context. So, so all that said, what is happening in the church today? And, and chapter 1 begins with a startling and, and very troubling statement. They say, in the United States, we are currently experiencing the largest and fastest religious shift in the history of our country as tens of millions of formerly regular Christian worshipers nationwide have decided they no longer desire to attend church at all. So they're arguing that we are in the midst of the most rapid, significant cha change 
in the religiosity of our nation since it founded, since it began. And uh, so here's just some numbers, and, and these are not encouraging numbers, all right? Uh, they say that 40 million adults, or roughly 16% of all American adults, let me think about that, 16% of all American adults used to attend church regularly, but have stopped doing so. That's a lot of people. 40 million people, 40 million adults, all right, have, have stopped attending. That, that is an incredible number of people. And they say as well, more people have left the church in the last 25 years than all the new people who became Christians from the first Great Awakening, the second Great Awakening, and the Billy Graham Crusades combined. Now, obviously, there are over 400 million people in the United States of America. That's a lot more people than there were during the first Great Awakening in the 1740s and 50s. All right? I don't know how many people were in America back then. Probably, I mean, it wasn't a lot. All right? But still, I mean, by the 1800s, the second Great Awakening was massive. You think about the hundreds of thousands of people that went to Billy Graham Crusades. More people have left the church in the last 25 years than all the people who came into the church during all three of those events combined. In 2019, approximately 3,000 Protestant churches were started in the United States, but 4,500 Protestant churches closed. So you're talking about, you know, basically, I mean, what is that? About 50%. More are closing than are being started. Yeah, Ron? Um, yeah, 76. Yeah. Yeah, well, they're saying, yeah. So they're saying, I mean, we're losing ground by 1,500 churches um, <clears throat> just in one year. So that's, that's, a, that's a big number. And um, now obviously, a lot of those would be churches that are not orthodox, preaching the gospel, though probably at one point, a lot of them did. Um, you know, so, so it's not like that's, you know, you're losing ground by 1,500 faithful gospel-preaching churches in fact, probably a good chunk, and probably, I, I would imagine the majority of those would not be churches that are preaching the gospel. Um, because you have a lot of, you know, these, the, the mainline liberal congregations are, are really, um, they're shutting down a lot of churches. I know the, the Roman Catholics are shutting down a lot of churches too. Um, but but this is still, as you think about just the broader landscape of America and, and how our, our, our culture is changing, that's huge. And then the breadth of all this uh, they say in the book, Roman Catholics, Protestants, and those who identify as other Christian have all dechurched equally at 32%. In the Protestant tradition, Presbyterians lead the dechurching, losing about 45% of their attenders over the last 25 years. That's incredible. And you think about that, 45%. Uh, the Methodists follow at 37%. And... Uh, and that would, be, that would be even bigger in the last year because the United Methodist Church last year, they've, um, there was a huge split within the United Methodist Church. And so in 2023, any United Methodist Church was allowed to leave the denomination uh, over the LGBTQ sexual revolution stuff. And so a massive number of United Methodist Churches left the denomination last year. So, I mean, their numbers would be horrible uh, in the past year. Yeah, Fred? Well, the denomination numbers would probably just be a loss in that particular denomination. Um, they could be going over to other ones, but if all of them are going the, wrong, the same direction, then uh, there's a lot more loss than gain. Yeah. And then Baptists are at 29%, Pentecostals at 26%. Now, one of my biggest disappointments in the book is that they, they never differentiate how being orthodox or committed to the gospel changes those statistics. So, um, because I am absolutely confident that, you know, like they say, you know, 
45% of Presbyterians uh, have left the church in the last 25 years. Well, I am absolutely certain that it would be very different if you, you know, con- it, it, I, I would love if they would have included a, a contrast between uh, Presbyterian churches that are faithful to the gospel and those that are not. So I know, for example, uh, the Presbyterian Church of America is a conservative uh, Presbyterian denomination, and they have seen a lot of growth. So, so you know, they're doing really well compared to the PCUSA, which is a liberal uh, Presbyterian denomination who's seen a lot of decline. So, but, but anyway, I mean, it, you included in that, the, the Southern Baptist Convention is the largest Christian denomination in America, and, um, and for the most part, I mean, well, Southern Baptist churches are supposed to be committed to orthodox doctrine. If they're not, they're not supposed to be in the SBC. And, and they've had a lot of decline themselves. So it's not just that uh, liberal churches are in decline. There, there are, uh, there's decline really across the board. I think this is interesting. Every age group is affected. Actually, baby boomers have the highest percentage of people de-churching at, at 35%. Now, uh, that's in part due to the fact that baby boomers used to go to church at a higher percentage than uh, Gen Z or millennials and things of that nature, but, but still, uh, baby boomers are de-churching at the highest percentage. Politics don't really matter. Democrats, Republicans, and independents are all equally affected by this. A couple exceptions that are just kind of interesting is that uh, in every tradition, the more education people have, the more likely they are to stay in the church as opposed to leaving the church. And we tend to think that people, you know, that school is what kills religious commitment, but actually across traditions, uh, people who have a college degree are actually more likely to stay than to leave. That was interesting. Another one that is a little bit surprising is that Americans who make less money are more likely to to church than people who make more money. So we would tend to think, you know, that, that people who are, who are wealthy just naturally wander away. And probably, you know, both of those things, education and money, uh, they, they, you know, people that have money and education tend to be more rooted in tradition, content with their lives. I, I think that, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that those people get saved more, uh, but that was just kind of an interesting, quirky thing that I thought was worth pointing out. So, so that's kind of just a broad view of what's happening. So why is it happening? And, and part two of the book uh, walks through three, five major categories of people who have dechurched. So they did all this research and, and kind of like narrowed it down into five general groups of people who are leaving the church. And, and it's worth uh, just noting that um, the first four groups would be people who are coming out of evangelical type churches, churches that believe the gospel, all right? It's just the last group um, that would be people coming out of a more a Catholicism or liberal Protestant type churches. So the first group, the biggest group, is cultural Christians, cultural Christians, and that's not probably surprising. So this represents 52% of the de-churched, 52% are people that at one time were in evangelical churches, church, gospel-preaching churches. And, and uh, this group, uh, the, the cultural Christian, as they're calling it, uh, they, they are people that, that you know, they, they didn't just ask them, you know, did they leave? They asked them doctrine questions and so forth to evaluate their faith. And a lot, all, all sorts of questions went into this study as it'll come out as we go. So, so the cultural Christians, they score very low as far as their commitment to orthodox doctrine. Th- these are people that used to go to an evangelical church, but, but they don't actually believe evangelical doctrine, all right, for the most part. So we can assume that most of these people were never truly born again. They, they never believed the gospel, never came to Christ, uh, but at one point attended an evangelical church more out of nostalgia, tradition, this is what our family has always done, than necessarily that they, they truly were committed to the faith. And, um, and so... Uh, This is a big, massive group, and of course, you know, there was a time, I don't know, I don't know, uh, you know, this is equally true in every community, but let's take, you live in Alabama, all right? There was a time, if you lived in Alabama, you better be going to a Baptist church, or there was a lot of cultural credit if you went to a Baptist church in Alabama in, you know, 30, 40 years ago. But of course, that is dissipating more and more. 
And so that cultural pressure to be involved in a church is, is becoming less and less. And so people that aren't, don't truly own their faith, are, they've got less and less selfish reason to go. So what, what can we uh, learn uh, about this group? And so I'm going to read a little bit of a longer quote here. He says, before they to church, speaking of the cultural Christian, cultural Christians needed authentic friendship and sincere community. They also needed to be ministered to and discipled earlier and with greater substance, especially in their teens and early 20s. Their doctrinal disparities reveal, at the very least, an absence of consistent biblical discipleship. Religious behaviors don't make sense to them because they have substantial cracks in their spiritual foundations. Many cultural Christians come from biblically and doctrinally shallow expressions of evangelical Christianity. And I think that that's not surprising, right? That you have people that were in church and they were there not because they were being taught the scriptures and called to a high level commitment to Christ. You know, they're being given a shallow message. They're really there for attractional, selfish reasons rather than a, a true commitment to Christ. They're not being given the, the doctrinal foundation, the apologetic foundation that they need to stand for Christ and live for Christ in the world. And so I think there's just a really important lesson here as we think about our church, as you think about your you know, parents, as you think about your kids, that you know, as the culture becomes hostile to Christianity, as we hear about 40 million people leaving the church, your impulse might be, well, we just got to keep them. So we got we to gotta lower the bar to keep people in the church. When in reality, as the culture becomes more and more hostile to Christianity, we really have to raise the bar. We have to call people to a higher commitment, not to a lower commitment. And we have to give them the tools and the resources that they can stand up to the culture and be faithful to Christ. You know, and so, and so you know, we, we want to remove unnecessary barriers, like I talked about in 1 Corinthians 9, but ultimately, we want to really make sure that we're calling them to a higher level. Because if they're just cultural Christians, if they're just in it for the nostalgia, it's a tradition, the cultural credit that they get for going to church, then they're going to bail. And so uh, there's, there's significant lessons there. Now, on the other side, reasons for hope. This is interesting. Uh, the, their studies, they, they asked people, one of the things they asked everyone was, was would you be interested in going back to an evangelical church? And half of cultural Christians are willing to return to an evangelical church. Half of them. Their main desire is social. They, they want relationships, though. Cultural Christians largely need your dinner table. They probably won't oblige your nudge or invitation to return to church as they need more relational connect, connectivity. They need consistent, real world, and increasingly close friendship to be drawn back to the church. So I think, you know, just, you know, with these five categories, what, what I'd encourage you, you know, maybe they're helpful is to think about, you know, there's someone you have at work, you know, a coworker you have, or a family member, or, or different things, you know, that these categories might be helpful to think about, you know, where is this person at? Do they believe the gospel? What, what is their commitment to Jesus? Why do they leave the church? How can we reach them? And so what they're really saying here is that these cultural Christians, I mean, they need to... They need to be evangelized, but as well, I mean, their, their responses, and we'll get into more of this as we go, their responses indicate that, that belonging, and we're going to see this over and over, family, fellowship, relationship, deep connections are massive as far as seeing these people come to Christ. So cultural Christian is the first main category. The second one they come up with, and this one I think is probably the most significant for us to think about, is mainstream evangelicals, mainstream evangelicals. So these are people who once attended an evangelical church, and they generally remain very faith, uh, favorable towards evangelical Christianity. So, so they, you know, they, again, they, they asked everyone doctrinal questions, and, and these are people who continue to, to affirm most evangelical doctrines. So for example, most of them believe in the Trinity. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They believe that Jesus' death on the cross was fully sufficient to pay for the sins of, of sinners. Uh, they believe that he rose again. They believe that Jesus is the only way. They believe that the Bible is the inspired and authoritative word of God. 
So, so these are people who hold to evangelical doctrine, but they have stopped going to an evangelical church. Now you might ask, well, why in the world would someone do that? If you believe all that, why would you stop going to church? Well, overwhelmingly, uh, they say that belonging, having real connection, real relationship in the church, is the most significant issue for these people. So, uh, this is a quote. Uh, they say, when asked why they stopped attending a house of worship, 19% said they moved and didn't find a new faith community. 14% said they didn't experience much love from their faith community. 14% said they didn't fit in. 13% said that COVID-19 got them out of the habit. 12% said that their friends weren't attending with them. And 13% said that recent family changes like divorce or remarriage made the church feel uncomfortable. So you notice with all of that, all of that is very much about relationships. And so they're saying to us that there is a massive number of people out there who believe the things that we believe, but they just feel disconnected. Uh, they feel lonely. Yeah, Ron? 14% um, said they didn't experience much love from their faith. So they, so they felt excluded. And Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. I mean, that, those aren't legitimate excuses. None of them are excuses. None of them, none of them at the end of the day are justification to stop going to church. So I'm not, I'm not saying that. All right. Uh, yeah, certainly. But at the same time, we want to reach them. Right? We want to reach these people. And so, and I, you know, just because someone says that a church didn't love them well does not mean that the church didn't love them well. Right? Like, I mean, I, I'm a pastor. I've heard plenty of stuff, you know, that, that people think of in their mind that is just not true. All right? So, so but, but, but in their mind, all right, the, the, thing, the, the, the thing that they feel like they've missed or that they're not getting that they need the church to give them is that sense of relationship. And, and I think, you know, with that too, um, you know, if we, want to, if we want people to really be, you know, people come into our church, start to get connected, that then what is, you know, one of the most crucial things that we can do to see someone move from kind of hanging out on the edges of the congregation to really becoming connected and faithful to the church is significant relationships. You know, because if someone is just kind of hanging out on the edges of the congregation for an extended period of time, then the chances that they're just going to kind of like fade away increase dramatically. So, you know, if you're burdened to see us as a church really make an impact in people's lives, then, then one of the most practical, significant things you can do is, is help people build significant relationships in the body. Because that is vital to, to them really being connected and staying in that church. The longer they're just kind of hanging out on the edges, the, 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 yeah, the higher the chances are that we lose them. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting question. You know, I, I mean, I'd say... You know, that, that we, I mean, we should be just consistently calling them to, to Jesus and, and setting a high bar of discipleship and commitment to the Lord and, you know, that, that we don't just want to attract them. You know, it's, you know it's been said, what, what it takes to get them is what it's going to take to keep them. So, you know, if we're, if we're getting people here with, you know, candy bars and, you know, games, well, then at some point that's what they're going to demand. And so I think, you know, yeah, probably, and I hadn't thought about that a whole lot, but I, I'd say, you know, calling them really to a, a commitment to Jesus and the faithfulness to Christ. And, and that's, and that obviously, like, we, we don't want, you know, Dustin talked this morning in Sunday school about false assurance. So, you know, the goal is not just to keep unbelievers in the church and make them think that they're saved, right? I mean, we, we want to call them to Christ, and, 
And obviously, if it becomes apparent over time that, that someone is not truly a disciple of Christ, well, the goal is not then just to keep them feeling happy and saved. We, we, want, to, we want them to see that they, they need the Lord. And, and so uh, that is, uh, that's important. So reason for hope with these people. This is a massive group of people. And, and this is interesting. A hundred percent, a hundred percent of those in our study, these mainstream evangelicals are actively willing to return to an evangelical church. So these people who say they hold to evangelical doctrine, but just aren't going to church, 100% of them are willing to come back. And the primary issue that would bring them back to the church is feeling like they belong. The main takeaway here is that many to church evangelicals simply need a friend to invite them to church. Now, I, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on, um, but I'll just mention this. I mean, there are a lot of people in our community that fit this description. I run into them all the time at Little League, basketball, around town, you know, who, who say, at least, at least say, all right, we don't know that they're born again, but they at least say that they believe Christian doctrine, but they're not going to church at all. So, so this is a ripe mission field in Apple Valley. People exactly like that. They're, they're everywhere in our community. So a uh, next group he mentions is ex-evangelicals, ex-evangelicals. And this is 17% of the people that are surveyed. This is, a, this is a harder group to hear about. So these are people who have permanently, purposefully exited evangelicalism. And, and uh, so these are people that once were in evangelical churches, and, and they are uh, basically adamant that they are not coming back. In fact, um, of this group, none, none of the ex-evangelicals surveyed said they are willing to return to an evangelical church. They have had it, they are done, they are through with, excuse me, gospel preaching churches. Now it is interesting that, that within this group, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are all denying essential doctrines. In fact, uh, they, they say this group can range from still serious Christians who merely um, eschew evangelical expressions of Christianity to those who have absolutely left their former faith behind. So these are people that don't like churches like ours, or at least don't want any part of a church like this. Now, you might say, well, why, why, would, they, why would they be that way? And, and you can probably think of some of the reasons, um, but, but the overarching reason uh, is uh, that they have been deeply hurt. Now, these are people that, um, you know, and, and again, you know, that hurt doesn't all, at least they feel hurt. All right, so it doesn't necessarily mean that they have a valid reason to feel hurt, but these are people that feel like they have been deeply hurt by, by the church, and they have no interest in, in being a part of it again. You know, so, so you think of things like sex abuse scandals would, would be a part of, of this um, sphere of people, people that were uh, endured some other kind of abuse, uh, people that they, you know, just whatever it would be. Uh, these are people that, that have been hurt by the church and, and don't want to go back. They haven't necessarily... Uh, rejected Christianity, though, though probably the most most have, um, uh, but but they're but they've been hurt deeply. And I think you know just I mean it's just a simple little lesson here. Um, most people, I, I know it's not true of everyone. Most people who who reject Christianity that once espoused it, they don't leave for intellectual reasons. Now they might have intellectual reasons they'll give you for leaving the faith. But, but it's usually rooted in something much more feeling and desire-driven. You know, so uh, when I did youth ministry, um, I mean, the vast majority of the kids, you know, that I had in youth group are living for the Lord, and praise God for that. But, you know, I remember in particular, we had, we had there was a period where we had three or four, we had a handful of, of girls uh, that were college age that we had had in youth group that all around the same time uh, denied Christianity, left the church. And, you know, and they would all you know, say, like, I don't believe the gospel, I don't believe these things, but, but for, I mean, I mean, it was like the same time, we had like three or four of them, you know, that, I mean, really, you know, they're in college, and they started dating an unbeliever, and, and, you know, at some point, they had to decide, am I going to, am I going to stick with my unbelieving boyfriend or girl, my unbelieving boyfriend, or am I going to be faithful to Christ, 
and they really wanted that unbelieving boyfriend. And so conveniently, they end up denying the faith. And it really wasn't that, you know, they were, they were convinced by intellectual arguments to leave Christianity. It was that they really wanted something over here, and that became the reason to justify denying things over here. And so, anyway, you know, I, I think we, we just need to be aware of those things and, and think about that as we minister. So, ex-evangelicals, I need to move along. Uh, the next group is black indigenous people of color. So, um, black indigenous people of color. So, so this would be obviously non-white people. And uh, it's interesting that they said, you know, they weren't trying to make racial profiles in doing this study, but, but this group kind of emerged on its own. And uh, for the most part, these are highly educated, upwardly mobile, affluent, non-white people who chose to regularly attend an evangelical church at some point in the past, uh, but now have stopped doing so. And uh, this is a group of people, uh, they are not, so, so this is not like, I mean, this is, you know, this would be people of color who, who have, who are doing well from a, a worldly standpoint. Uh, there's a whole slew of these people uh, that have left uh, evangelical churches. Uh, they're not very orthodox in their beliefs, um, but they are willing to return to an evangelical church. And really, the primary reason these people have left the church is feeling like they don't fit, um, or differences with their parents. So again, people that grew up in probably a strong Christian tradition, um, but you know, for whatever reason, don't seem to fit. And then the last group is mainline Protestants and Catholics. So, so this would be just a whole slew of people uh, that, that used to uh, regularly attend um, a liberal Protestant church or, or a Catholic church. And, um, and these are people who have left for a variety of reasons, um, politics, convictions, uh, just busyness, lack of priority. And uh, these are people that probably never would have even professed to believe the gospel. Um, but, but, but they are, uh, and so they're people that, that you know, if you're going to reach these people for Christ, it's going to take a lot of work. And a lot of times they are highly offended that you would even suggest that they are not right with God, right? So, I mean, they're not going to church anywhere, but, but they might still consider themselves uh, to be a Lutheran or a Catholic or a Methodist or a Presbyterian. And, uh, I, you know, there were a lot of these people um, in my context growing up. And then when we lived in Michigan uh, that, you know, they, uh, they never go, um, but, but they, um, and church is clearly not a priority. So, but they are hard people to reach. And, and there's some of those people around here as well. I think you'd see a lot more of these, particularly in the Midwest, probably the Northeast, um, but, but they're here as well. So those are the five categories. So I want to talk some about, how, you know, what do we do about this? How, how do we reach people? Well, well, here's, you know, just three. And well, yeah, let me go through some stuff. And if you've got comments, uh, questions, feel free to jump in. So, so what should stand out to you about their findings? Well, first of all, uh, something I really want to emphasize, something that I take as a big takeaway, is that we want to target evangelicals in our community. So again, um, you know, this is a massive segment of people. There are loads of people all around us in America who profess to believe evangelical doctrines but are not going to a gospel preaching church. And if you meet those people, and they're, they, again, they are everywhere, when you meet those people, those are people you want to go after, right? And... Um, so again, uh, I, think, I think it was 100% of them said that they are willing to go back. So, so here's some more specific um, numbers they give. 51% of the de-churched evangelicals we surveyed said they think they will one day return to church. They expect to do so. 18% are very willing and 33% are somewhat willing. So, so these people are out there. I mean, they are low-hanging fruit for us to go after. And... Um, and so with these people, you know, you, I, I think you want to you think about, you want to think carefully about how you minister to them. So specifically, I mean, these de-churched evangelicals, I mean, they hold to evangelical doctrines. So you don't want to, you don't, you don't need to start with the Romans road, right? Like, like we tend to think you meet someone who doesn't go to church, first thing you do, you got to share the gospel with them, get them saved. And it might, might be a good thing to, to work towards confirming that they understand and believe the gospel. We absolutely should do that. But a lot of these people, 
It's not that they don't understand the gospel. They do understand the gospel. Where they really need you to challenge them is about the transformative implications of the gospel. You know, that that the gospel is not just a a ticket to heaven. These people need to be challenged to, to, to understand that to be a Christian is to follow Christ. And to follow Christ is to use your spiritual gifts in the context of the church for the edification of the body. Now, as you challenge these people along those lines, it might very well become apparent that while they think that they are saved, they are not. Because they can say all the right things and they would, you know, on a survey, affirm that they believe all these doctrines, but they have no fruit. And of course, at that point, they, they need to understand the implications of the gospel and, uh, and that they might not truly be born again. Um, you know, but, but, but again, you don't just start with the Romans road. You know, identify what's going on in these people's lives, help them understand how the gospel needs to hit them and, and reach them accordingly. And then with that, Another really just massive issue that, that I've already mentioned is that we need to help these people belong in the church. So again, I mean, that issue comes up with, with like every group in this study that there are so many people out there in our culture that simply need the right person to invite them to church. They need a friend, someone who loves them, someone who is committed to them, that, that will bring them to church, introduce them to others, make them feel welcome, and, and bring them into the community. And, and, so, and so that is huge. You know, that, you know, if you're gonna, if you got a neighbor that you're gonna bring to church, your work is not done when you get them in the door. That, it's just starting. You get them in the door, and you wanna introduce them to five people. You know, and make conversation. Um, you know, and so, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not as good at this as I should be, but, you know, if, you know if, I'm, if I'm talking, you know, I'm talking on Sunday morning to someone that I know is relatively new to the church, you know, I, I don't just want to visit with them. I, I want to start introducing them to people, you know. So, you know, I'm talking to, you know, this guy over here, and, you know, and Ron comes by, like, hey, have you met Ron yet? You know, and so making those kinds of connections is, is absolutely huge. So, so those are some, you know, I mean, I think, I mean, for me, you know, just a, a, a huge, huge takeaway here is, is that there are all these people around us that, uh, that we have a great opportunity. Now, now they're not going to be around forever, right? You know, the more dechurching that takes place, the, um, the number of these people out there that profess to believe evangelical doctrine, they're just sitting there waiting for us to reach, that, that number is going to decline. But, but man, while they're there, we, we want to go after those people and, and reach them with the gospel. Um. Any comment there, thought there before I move on? Yeah, Dr. Brock? Yeah. They don't, I, I didn't see a, a stat like that in the study, but that would be an, an interesting one to find out. Yeah, kids that, you know, you know, they prayed a prayer and they got dunked at a young age and, and it never really was a true commitment. I'm sure that, particularly among the cultural Christian group, would be really high. Yeah. But they didn't, they didn't I, don't, I didn't see anything that, about that specific issue. Yeah. Yeah, Daniel? Yeah, good book. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember the stages that he gives. It's been a couple years since I read that book, but I, mean, I think in general, you know, to go along, I mean, we want to, you know, you, you, if you're going to do good evangelism, you can't just have like your like 
five-step plan, you've got to be, I mean, it's good to have a five-step plan, an outline, but you, but you do want to be listening and adapting and listening to the person that's there, you know, and, and tailoring how you're doing evangelism to the situation and, you know, I mean, behold, now is the acceptable time, behold, now is the day of salvation. As we talked about this morning, Jesus could come at any time, so, so we don't want to lull people into thinking that they've just got forever to receive Christ. We want them to get saved today if they're not. But obviously, you know, you don't always have the opportunity to do that and, and, to, and to give that sort. So take the opportunity that's in front of you. I, I think that's certainly fair. Yeah, good. Yeah, Nathan? Yeah. No, I, I think that's probably true that even if they're like a, even if they're answering those questions in the survey correctly, it doesn't mean that they've truly been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. So I think that's that's absolutely fair. Um, but I, I mean, we've had we've had a lot of people come into our church since I've been here that I would you know they weren't attending anywhere, and you know, but but the Spirit of God. I don't know, you know, the, the way the Spirit moves, and, you know, and, and you, you've said, you know, forever leave. I mean, like, obviously, these people came back into the church, you know, so the Holy Spirit worked in their lives, and, um, yeah, I would tend to think if someone just walks away and never, you know, makes any effort to get into a gospel-preaching church for 50 years, and then they die, you know, my confidence in their salvation is going to be pretty low, um, so that's fair, but I'm just, you know, but I think there probably are a lot of people out there that, you know, they really are saved, but they just need someone to push them and get on them and because people are lazy and, and they, they get out of routines and they get busy and all those things. And, and at the very least, these are people that are open to gospel conversation in a way that other people are not, right? So, so even if they're not genuinely saved, they say they believe the Bible is the word of God. Well, they're a whole lot easier to talk to about the gospel than someone that thinks the Bible's just a bunch of baloney. So, uh, so I think they are a really good target um, for, for evangelism, ministry, people to go after. Yeah. All right, so just a few other lessons. Um, yeah, who's got? Yeah, Esther?
Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, and if they've always, you know, if the church was always just there to, and even presented itself as we're here to serve you, and that's, you know, we're, you know, I think, you know, sometimes in, you know, market driven ministry is a big movement in the 80s and 90s. And so, you know, if church is all built around, you know, appealing to what you want, well, what happens when you no longer want the church and the church hasn't called you to something higher? So, yeah, and I agree with the, the hurt thing, absolutely. Uh, the abuses, uh, pastors that have done a poor... I mean, I was interacting with a church member before Christmas who's uh, been bringing a friend to church here, and and this friend's husband uh, grew up in a, you know, at least according to his words, a, a legalistic, harsh church context and just wants nothing to do with with coming to church. And so um, he did come on Christmas Eve, um, but but there's there's certainly lots of people around like that. So just a few other uh, lessons... Um, uh, so, you know, just interesting things from the survey that I think we can learn from. Uh, one, another thing they bring up is emphasizing physical attendance to church. So, according to the 2022 Pew Research, 21% of practicing Christians are only worshiping online. 21%. Our own research shows that percentage is even higher at around a third of practicing Christians. Think about that. A third of people in, our Ameri- in, in, in the United States who profess faith in Christ are, are only worshiping online. They watch Charles Stanley on TV. They're, they're watching online services. They're not in the church. And so uh, they, they mention here that um, they say most de church evangelicals still worship online, but they do so at their convenience. What is intended as a new front door is often having the opposite effect by helping the church leave through the back door. I'm not saying we're going to shut down live stream. I think our live stream has real value for people who can't be here. But I think it's just a good thing to remember that we we always want to emphasize that being here is the goal. And the live stream is there for those who cannot, in the providence of God, do that. Another thing um, that is huge here is parent wisely and model godliness. They have a whole chapter on the generational handoff and, you know, how parents... Um, play a huge role in in this dechurching, and um, I, I mean, we could share a ton of stuff from that chapter. But um, a huge number of dechurched evangelicals, thirty percent, thirty percent said that if their parents had just embodied love, joy, gentleness, and kindness, or listened to them more, they might not have left the church. So, hypocrisy, you know, lack of the fruit of the spirit is huge. You know, so, so parents, you need to be the same person at home that you are at church. You need, you know, if, if, you're, if, you're playing, if you're playing the game, your kids can see that you're playing the game. Your faith needs to be real, and it needs to be real in every sphere of life. And, and it needs to produce genuine godliness in you um, if you're going to pass it on to your kids. And, um, and so that, that is massive. And so... You know, parents, the best gift you can give your kids is not an expensive college education, as good as that is. The best gift that you can give to your kids is not, you know, that you have them in 20 sports leagues and do everything under the sun. The very best thing you can give your kid is a consistent walk with God. That is the best gift you can give your child, is that you are walking with Jesus and calling them to do the same. And hypocrisy is, is a massive part of all of this. Another important lesson is love people well. We, we've talked about that a lot, that relational failures are a big piece of this whole puzzle. And I get, you know, I think it, it, that oftentimes ends up being an excuse versus a root issue, but we, we do need to love people well. We, we need to show them Christ. Uh, here's another one, is I think that, that all this challenges us that we need to shift our apologetic focus. Um. So, you know, it used to be, you know, that, well, when, when you know, you think back to um, really even postmodern America, especially modern America, you know, there's big emphasis on apologetics. You need to prove to people that the Bible is true. You know, give them scientific, rational arguments to prove the Bible is true, 
And so that's been a big focus. And then as well, another big focus of evangelism in America has long been counteracting legalism. Show them, you know, grace alone through faith alone and Christ alone. And, and I, this was a fascinating quote. They say, over the last 50 years, it appears fewer people are asking, is Jesus true? And more are asking, is Jesus good? And is Jesus beautiful? People are asking more pragmatic, existential, and aesthetic questions as post-modernity, secularism, and other complex sociological, economic, political, psychological, and technological forces have them increasingly fractured culturally, relationally, and individually. People are looking for a better self, city, country, and world, and nobody seems to have the answers. And so what he is saying there is, now, now, now I want to be clear that, that we always, if you're going to share the gospel, you have to talk about heaven and hell, right? You have to talk about uh, those things, that, the, the, the fundamentals of the gospel, but they're simply pointing out that, that people, people are increasingly concerned about things like, you know, and, and we could laugh at this, world peace, you know, the good of their neighbor, orphans and social things. And so, I, you know, I think, you know, it's just, you know, maybe something to think about is that the gospel addresses all, Jesus is going to fix everything that's broken. You know, and obviously, like, you need to get saved is absolutely the most important thing, but, but you know, as you, you, know, as you, as you think about the gospel, the good news of, of the Bible it's not just that God is saving souls. You know, Jesus is also on a mission to fix everything that is broken. And so, you know, maybe that's an emphasis that, that we can bring up more uh, than we necessarily used to. And so, so I think that's uh, just, you know, again, being aware of, of, of people and their concerns. And obviously, you know, you don't compromise the faith. You don't um, blur what really matters, um, but, but I think certainly the Bible answers those things in a way that no one else does. There's a lot of depressed people in our culture, a lot of lonely people in our culture. You know, the Bible has real answers for people that they are not going to find anywhere else. Another lesson is stand by your convictions. Now, they don't, I, I wish they talked about this more, but, but the last 100 years of church history proves definitively that the answer to de-churching is not to compromise to get to the level of the people who are de-churching. The churches that are strong today are not the ones that compromise with the culture. The places where the gospel is growing and where churches are growing are churches that believe something, that have backbone, that stand for something and, and believe in it and it changes them. You know, so it's not, it's not churches that believe the gospel and are zealous for Christ that are shutting their doors. It's the ones that tried to just bend, 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 bend with the culture. And so, you know, the answer is not to accommodate our convictions. Our, the answer is to stand by them and to call people to do the same. This is, this is and this one's interesting. Um, this is a quote. One of the largest studies of religious attitudes of LGBT persons found that 76% of LGBT people are open to returning to their religious community and their practices. The same study found that 86%, 86% of LGBT persons were raised in a faith community and more than three-fourths were raised in theologically conservative religious communities. That's really sad. But, but then this is interesting. Further, of those willing to return, only 8% of respondents indicated a desire for their faith community to change their theology as something that would influence them to return. So we tend to think, you know, people are offended by our convictions and our values, and so the way we reach them is to give up our convictions and values. But they're even saying that's not what they expect. They expect us to be true to what we believe, and, and so, you know, don't, I mean, I, I hope that that, go, you know, in this context, that probably goes without saying for the most part, but, but you know, just, um, I mean, if you have family members and so forth that you know, you may, maybe you, you have those kinds of tensions in your family, and the answer to those tensions is not to, you know, just start calling people by their pronouns, and I mean, they may not like it that you don't call them by their pronouns or whatever they want to say, but, but the truth is, is that we need to be faithful to Christ, and, and as we do that, as, as we have that strength about us and that conviction about us, that's going to go a lot further than, than just being, you know, being um, putty and, and bending with what's going on.
And then one other thing is pursue teenagers and young adults. Religious interest is lowest, lowest among 18 to 25 year olds. So, so the stage of life where people wander from the church the most is from 18 to 25. So we need to aggressively build into teen- young people and teenagers the convictions to stand as they gain more freedom. And then as well, uh, we need to, to not neglect that age group, that 18 to 25-year-old age group, and, and help them be faithful, uh, give them community, give them accountability as they endure that stage of life. All right, any other questions? Yeah, Ron? Yeah, well, I mean, the gospel is what's going to save them. I mean, all, all the, I, I, think, I think I know which one you're talking about. Basically, they're just talking about that people are, uh, that quote was talking about, um, you know, that, that the culture is increasingly hostile and harsh and difficult and people are hurting. Well, do you want me to read them again? So you... Okay. Yeah, I can. Okay. All right. People are asking more pragmatic, existential, and aesthetic questions as postmodernity, secularism, and other complex sociological, economic, political, psychological, and technological forces have them increasingly fractured. Yeah. Well, I'm not, you know, it's not what I'm telling them. I'm just, you're trying to understand people and, and where they're hurting and, and where, we can, where we can minister to them. All right. Yeah, Pastor Tim. And it satisfies all those human longings that are rooted in the image of God. People are lonely. I mean, you, you, know, you don't have to get online very long and say, I mean, how much obsession is there with mental health, loneliness, despair, mental health crisis? I mean, that's everywhere. It's because people aren't in the community of the church. They're isolated. They're lonely. They need Jesus. You know, all that. And so we, we do have the answers, absolutely. Yeah, well, I got <laughs> Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I haven't, I haven't put, I haven't put specific thought into that, but that is a. That's a. Yeah, well, that's that's a good call. Yeah, and I, I think that, that would be a good thing for me to, I'll have to think about that, yeah. I don't have a, I, I don't know what my next Sunday night series is, so maybe we'll do something along those lines, that'd be good. All right, Ben, we'll.
Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. All right, it's late, and so I, you know, it's probably we could, and I'd love to continue the conversation, but I don't want to make everyone endure the conversation. So, um, so let's pray, and we do need to set up for a while, and we'll go from there. Lord, thank you for the gospel that you've given to us, for the stewardship we've received. Lord, help us to be good stewards of it and to share it, to proclaim it, to stand on it. And God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would do in the hearts of people what we could never do ourselves, that he would give life to the dead, that he would transform lives, that we would build real community that is anchored in the gospel and in supernatural power, not anything in us. And God, would you be glorified through all of it. In Jesus' name, amen.